uh, I'm Mina. Uh, you all heard the little spiel. Um, I just finished my sophomore year of college. Uh, this was a project that I did um, for a class called Memory, History, and the Archives that I took my sophomore fall. Um, it was our final project for the class and a professor kind of gave us an option to either write a 15 to 20 page long research paper or to uh, engage in a more creative project. And so I picked the creative project because I didn't want to write a 20 page paper. Um, this, uh, the class was uh, taught by Professor Joshua Giles, if you all are interested in kind of learning more about him and some of his work. Um, Memory History in the Archive was a class where we uh, sort of explored questions of um, how we remember history and how history is produced in the first place. Uh, what does it mean to uh, like go into the archive, what does it mean to create an archive, uh, what does it mean to um, extract a story from the archive and then construct a narrative from that. And I think that um, all of these questions were kind of uh, central to this project. Um, so film seemed like kind of an intuitive medium uh, for the project. During the semester, we watched um, an Arthur Jaffa film called Love is the Message, The Message is Death. Uh, highly recommend it. Uh, it's on YouTube somewhere, um, or I can just send the link to Rodrigo and he can share it with you all after this. Um, but the sort of fragmented and uh, non-linear nature of the film was really striking to me. Um, it reminded me a lot of the ways in which uh, debate memory kind of, especially in LD, it, it feels kind of fragmented and non-linear. Um, stories are more often than not just passed uh, along through word of mouth. Um, stories are changed and are forgotten. And the way that we understand our history is kind of constantly moving. Um, and, you know, the final film didn't really end up uh, where I thought it would, but this is kind of where it started, is with this film. The love is the message, the message is death. Uh, my intention with this project was really just to engage uh, in an open conversation with uh, members of the debate community about uh, what we just call radical Black praxis in debate, uh, whatever that might mean to whoever I was talking to at the time. Um, I tried to ask really open-ended questions, um, and I wasn't really looking for particular answers, uh, mostly because I don't know this history, and I just wanted to know what the people who lived through the history and who um, have sort of closer uh, and more relevant interpersonal relationships with people who are part of this history, uh, what they had to say. Uh, because I, I don't know anything and I don't have anything to say. Um, I ended up collecting uh, a little bit over 10 hours of footage. Uh, so it was a lot to try to cut this down to a viewable length, especially a viewable length for uh, a class for a professor who was not a film professor. Um, so, you know, I think that this film kind of barely scratches the surface, but, uh, I will play the film soon, but I think sort of the last thought that I had was each, each person that I spoke to offered a really incredible insight into the implication of lost histories and, uh, different interpretations of radicalities and, uh, you know, our understanding of what stories make it and what stories don't, um, the final product of the film was heavily influenced by my class's reading of Sadia Hartman's Wayward Lives. Um, would also recommend that book if you all have not read it yet. Um, I focus not so much on trying to reconstruct the whole history, um, but rather I aim to uh, capture something else that uh, kind of despite whatever differences existed in interpretation or opinion um, or perspective or experience uh, that Blackness has uh, persisted in debate and therefore has persistently been and still is by its very nature um, radical. And I think that is kind of the, the thesis, if you will, of uh, the film that you all are about to see. So uh, this film is called uh, Do You Desire to Remember Breath, Blackness, and Debate? Um, and I hope you all enjoy it. Whoop, I'm going to share my screen now. <laughs> What is your dream, if anything, for the past, present, and future of Blackness and debate?
Uh, it's also my bad. I thought the last screen recording happened, but then it didn't. Um, so just to start again, uh, could you say your full name, the school and association that you work with, and your position? Yeah. Uh, my name is Aaron Timmons. Uh, Daryl Birch. Sydney Simon. Uh, Evan Engel. My full name is Ignacio Evans. Um, I guess the community calls me Iggy. Devin Cooper. Shante Jordan. Christopher Rambo. My full name is Elijah Smith. I'm currently the director of Rutgers North. I'm a dental school director of debate. I am the head debate coach at the University of Georgia. Director of the Radio. 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 Director I debated for Harvard Westlake School in Los Angeles for three years, and I currently coach there and independently coach a couple of kids on the side. I am a debate coach who works largely with independence, with coaching independence. Uh, you're not necessarily like working with the school, so if you're not on the school's payroll, uh, and you kind of have to figure out uh, with the child's parents what things work, whereas if you're working for a program, uh, the program kind of establishes those things. They also have a lot more resources. If a program is lost, or if debaters are not allowed to debate, and you have emails being sent to administrators, or if you have students being accosted in an active debate, so I think that is much more likely to be detrimental now because it could result in the loss of programs. Now, granted, you know, loss of life based on slavery and, you know, racism and it's all of that, yes. It's just so much worse because you have more programs, you have more individuals, and you have more people that just don't believe these arguments belong in, in debate. You have to think about, um, to the degree that it's possible, my perspective the number of black people that are in debate now. Uh, very Hello, uh, Mina, can you stop screen sharing? I'm just going to switch it to my laptop because I think the volume might be better because someone yeah. texted me that they weren't able to hear super well. So can you just tell me the timestamp you had it on? Ooh, I just closed it. Okay, I think I've got it. Sorry. You're good. And you can uh, mute now, Mina. I agree that it's possible. My, you have to think about um, to the degree that it's possible. My perspective, the number of black people that are in debate now uh, versus when I did it 40 years ago. I remember debating being two people who are black in four years. Now it has expanded due to um, urban debate leagues, due to a variety of different factors to push uh, inclusion, that there are now more black people in the space of debate. During the 1960s, when tournament competition at the collegiate level was at its height, you can understand why most intellectual black students didn't get involved in like tournament debating because the civil rights movement was going on. So things like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was taking all the articulate, you know, well-educated, intellectual black students. At the collegiate level, you don't see any historically black colleges or universities participate in the activity. And so at the high school level, that also became true. You just didn't see any black debaters. Like when I debated, I, w I was like, I could go to tournaments and, and not see anybody who looked like me. I've watched people, I've been here long enough now to watch people leave and then watch them come back and they have a whole freak out moment. Like, this is not what I thought it was. And the only underlying factor that they have is not necessarily like the base, not the same, like a claim, warrant, and impact, and significance are still the same to them. In what context do we make those arguments uh, scares them. And then who is around? Like literally the amount of bodies who are at any particular venue and then what are their demands of scaring people in and out of debate debates are not even happening yet you're like there's too many black people oh my god it's like what um 
<laughs> so how would you describe debate to someone who doesn't do it? Uh, an intellectual blood sport. High speed chess, uh, but with arguments. The type of debate that I do and coach is not like a presidential debate. So like, get that out of your head. We formally argue about certain political issues that we have democratically chosen. Well, debate is a competitive um, opportunity for students to really delve into, um, you know, important topics of the day uh, and uh, get an opportunity to present both sides of the issue. Um, it teaches research, public speaking skills, um, just probably the single greatest activity, I think, in terms of teaching critical thinking and um, appreciation of argumentation and viewpoints from various sides. I remember one time, a long time ago, somebody called it organized fussing. And it's kind of like uh, a good way to describe a competitive activity amongst intellectual students that engage in argumentation over a given topic throughout the year. More than anything, I think it involves learning and dealing with how to defend a position and sort of understand one's uh, opinions and values and how to defend them. I was, a, I was a part of the very first school um, in the United States to be a part of the first Urban Debate League in America, which was the Atlanta Urban Debate League. And Urban Debate League is, at least when it started in 1988, maybe depicted a little bit differently now because I think it's definitely a lot larger and sort of run by corporate world now. Urban Debate Leagues are centered in urban areas around various cities in the U.S. Um, and they were a way to get inner city kids involved in policy debate at the time. You know, now I think there's about 30 to 40 cities around America that have urban debate leagues. And so it creates access um, at the at sort of the community level. And it actually re rooted in what we think is best for actual kids um, to make them better adults, to help them help our community, uh, is rooted in the skills that we teach them, hopefully help make them better people to be able to help our communities. Uh, and be better advocates for the things that are important in their lives and in our community. I um, was the first black person to win the Dixon Bailey, and I remember a sort of significant reaction from uh, the black people in the community around me as being like, we did it, like, this is it. Um, and I think that that was perhaps the most radical that I felt, but again, it, you know, my celebration was not because you know, I felt like something had changed or I'd done something um, other than you know, win and succeed and sort of individual success. Can you, can you explain what the Dukes of Bailey Cup is? Oh, uh, it is an award for season-long excellence that is calculated based on the performances at uh, five composite tournaments. And they average your best five scores and the person who has the highest number of points at the end of the year. Um, well, for me, I started when I was in the Baltimore Urban Debate League. Um, I feel like that <clears throat> was an experience that was given to me that was probably once in a lifetime. And I think, like, the idea of me being in the UDL was something that influenced me to want to give back to folks because I know that there were a lot of people when I was in the UDL that didn't have to help me because they were college debaters, but they actually did. I think of people, you know, who have mentored me like Aaron Timmons or Ed Williams or, you know, Jonathan Alston or a lot of people from Newark, like Roger Leone. Uh, I think of, you know, Daryl Birch. I think of Shanera. I think of Rashad. I think of, you know, I think of Ryan. I think of Toya. I think of Iggy. But I used to watch their videos and of them debating and standing up and saying the things that were really important to them. And they were also mentoring people who came after them. First, I love to teach and um, I love working with young people um, to see them, uh, a term that I use is epistemologically grow, see them like come and formulate their identity and how to articulate who they are and how they see the world. Uh, to be a black coach and to be a black woman coach in debate, which I just, I didn't really, I didn't see that period, like, <laughs> when I was in debate, and frankly, still don't really see it. Uh, there's, like, one other Black woman coach in debate that I can think of, um, and, yeah, we don't really exist in this activity because 
um, you know, there's very high turnover for Black debaters, period, but especially for Black women in this activity. What do you think when you hear the phrase radical Black praxis in debate? I think a lot of things. I think the first thing to me I hear is that comes to mind is Louisville. The University of Louisville. Louisville Project. Louisville Project. A lot of current debaters have suffered what I call the miseducation of the Negro as it relates to uh, the debate history. It's like the Louisville Project, et cetera. The Louisville Project, which uh, began in the 90s and um, really brought in Black debaters who people didn't consider debaters um, and allowed for them to be themselves if arguments are seen as talking all proper and only talking about policy arguments. Uh, and someone comes in and they're like, how are you going to talk about policy when you aren't talking when you aren't talking about the way that implicates my everyday life? Or why should I talk about environmental policy when I can't even turn the lights on in my house because of XYZ factors that are preventing us from being able to live our best lives? We uh, decided that there wasn't enough meaningful Black participation that existed within debate, and that became the purpose of Malcolm, the Malcolm X uh, Global Debate Project. Dr. Eddie Warner took a hip hop class that he was teaching and recruited a bunch of people from that class to participate in debate. 2003-2004 season, uh, Liz Jones and Tanya Green had uh, vast success. They were in the quarters of CETA and the quarters of NDT, and that kind of like launched a whole new idea of how to participate in the activity. I don't know if the debate community is interested in remembering who black people are and how they're connected to black people. Um, the Louisville folks decided that they wanted to do something different, that there needed to be perhaps a three-tier approach to argumentation uh, that included academic resources, that included your personal experience, uh, and that included kind of a third uh, kind of, uh, another approach to um, evidence. She wouldn't say Dr. Mina Lee, professor at Princeton, uh, rather you might uh, play a song from an artist uh, who is making an argument uh, in the way that they're doing things, but uh, just a little bit different. This is also in the context of a whole lot of radical uh, politics and deconstruction and that sort of thing in academia. So this is, I mean, this kind of coincides with uh, you know, the deconstructionist movement in academia, right? Uh, the, the feminist movement in academia, all of those different things, right? This is, I mean, these things are not divorced. There was a radicalism in questioning the canon in academia then that radicalism also brought itself into debate, which is kind of a reflection of academia as well. A lot of that, too, has to do with uh, the inspirations that we had from um, the University of Texas and, I guess, the creation of the critique in debate in which they like had philosophical criticisms of the way in which we construct knowledge and the way in which we address the normative question of the resolution. Not just the Louisville Project, but what were Black debaters doing in the 60s? They existed, right? They were insane. The term radical sometimes, I think, is, is misconstrued as to what that means, because I think people uh, don't really have a good articulation of what normative praxis is and how power structures work within normative practice. You know, what the community norm has been of, you know, white male-centered debate that was from the beginning. Um, I, I, when I hear radical debate practice, I think back to like the 1930s when you actually had some of the first black debate programs and black debaters around the country competing. Uh, but during a time where they could be lynched or during a time where it wasn't, you know, popular to allow black people to be educated or compete um, in debate. And so I think about the coaches that would drive the debaters in the back roads of Texas trying to get to tournaments and not knowing if they would make it or make it back from those tournaments. The thought process when I think of that is there is no quit. Like, a lot of people would probably describe that as resilient, but, like, I don't think that we're overcoming anything other than 
I'm going to do what I want. We're going to do what we can. And then we're going to do what you said we wasn't supposed to. Like, because to me, like, to be black is too radical, right? Like, I mean, it, mm-hmm. you're black. Everything you do is going to be hyper uh, uh, scrutinized, right? Like, so black radicality is like just existing within the space and uh, pushing uh, and being heard in terms of your voice and having your voice based on uh, scholarship that was produced within our community. You gotta live as an adult, and you have to pay bills, and you can't be like, oh, government, fuck the system. It's like, those are just things that are part of your life. History is very short. Like, the debate memory of the activity is very short, and I guess for context, probably because um, a lot of the people who are judges in this activity are fairly young. Like, they're people who are in high school, uh, I mean, not high school, in college. Lack of history means that the black radical praxis that black folk have is diminished a little bit. And also the community's response to ways in which black people rise up in the activity is not uh, one that takes into account history, which means that things are doomed to repeat themselves. So, so I think radical praxis attempts to uh, attack hegemonic power structures of discourse that tend to exclude marginalized bodies or people that are different and a lot of that commitment looks different in different generations right i know the generations before me in a lot of ways were fighting to just be like i look we want to see the table what are the tools other than heart will unwill in will and people like none of this is possible without people. Like I guess if you get rid of all the black people, all the people who care about black people, and all the black people, I mean all the people who are next to black people, then this would look different. I was a part of the legal project uh, starting in 2004, 2005 debate season as a freshman. I stayed there until I was a sophomore, and um, then I decided to transfer to uh, Towson University, where I still continued to do similar arguments, but we decided to push more of the boundaries to say we're going to speak about like white supremacy and things that nature and black aesthetics. And we kind of started talking about um, black liberation theology, as well as um, arguments about core theories, things that nature. It's the same genre, but there are different artists who approach it in a very different way, if that makes sense, Mm -hmm. right? For black radicality uh, in debate. I don't think there is a singular definition as to what that is. Mm -hmm. And if it's to a point where we're saying, no, that's not black enough, that's an authenticity test that I'm not sure if I'm comfortable, that I'm not comfortable with. Frankly, because you shouldn't exist uh, given the historical realities of being black. And so when you say, I'm black and I'm here, uh, I think it, it makes it, it has a radical connotation almost immediately. And people are not aware of that, which is why even in the 2019, 2020 context, it's still considered radical to be black because people don't think that, people have not fully grasped the reality of blackness being radical in and of itself. No matter where you put us or where you put blackness, that it finds a way to survive. It finds a way to create. It finds a way to become. And so I think in that Blackness inevitably flourishes by I did certain things based on the stories or the people came before me. I think all those things, you know, pushed to a certain point that people have been fighting for for a long time. And I think I was just lucky enough to be, you know, the person giving that speech. I don't know, last, was it 20 years? Anything before that? Personally, I have no idea. If you think about the American Journal of Medicine allowing it to be published that black people lose their rationality along with coming along along with puberty. If you just allow if you just put that in your head and you imagine that that is the context under which black people start engaging in debates. Um, if you think about lynching, Jim Crow segregation, as I said, 19th century, anthropology, sociology, medicine, all of that, 
happening, that is sort of the crucible under which black debate is born, to publicly engage in academic intellectual discourse. At that time in history, uh, when looking at a white person in the eye could be punishable by death, is by its very, by its very nature radical. Uh, what would you say is your dream, 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 or vision, dream, dream, or hope for the past, present, and future of Blackness and debate? I would like to see what someone calls for me the golden parachute. Can you play? Can you get them on the field? Can you get them in the debate round? Can you get the trophy? Can you win CETA? Can you win the NDT? These are great questions, but they're built for debaters who don't have to ask, what do I do next? My dream is that blackness in debate is no longer a stigma. And I think that there are a litany of black people that have sort of a certain, you know, kind of politics has become synonymous or associated with black debate. Um, and I think that without meaning to, I think there is a significant contingent of the community that uh, is at least surprised when a or some black people do not conform to those ideas. And they're just sort of a, you know, prove yourself otherwise uh, kind of mentality is such that, uh, you know, I think that it is stigmatic in some ways. I want, well, I want debate. I want the people in it to really try to uh, create a space where people are welcome, right? And, right, and welcomed, you know, with who they are, their authentic selves. Well, I, I think for the past, the past has done a great job in creating the present. Um, and whether young debaters acknowledge that or not, I think that is just true. Uh, just for it to continue to flourish, for it to continue to be innovative, and I think books need to be written. I would love to see, like, like you know, I watched the movie The Great Debaters, but I don't think there's anything that really talks about the contemporary aspect of, of, of Black people within the debate that has happened, and, and I think there's a story to be told. I guess my dream for Blackness in debate is that, and I'm really big on this, is that I wish that the community would stop trying to just include Black debaters and actually go out of their way to create equitable ways in which Black debaters can participate in that activity. We recognize that some people have not been here, and therefore we need to kind of go out of our way and provide more resources and provide more assistance to make sure not only that they're here, but they feel comfortable being here. Like if I had a dream, uh, my dream would be that debate would be accessible for Black students, no matter how they came, at every level. And then also with the blessing that, like, there's an understanding that those same debaters could be as great as they are, no matter what kind of style of debate they did. And this is going back to African rhetoric, right? Like, because there's ethos, pathos, logos, but in ancient, in ancient African rhetoric, uh, there's a fourth category. And that fourth category is, is it good for the community? I feel like when we were debating, we had a vision that, you know, there would be first rounds who are Black, that there would be teams that are able to, like, make these arguments and feel comfortable doing it, um, free of, like, any of the discriminatory nature that exists in the community. But I feel like at this point, like, that was only a pipe dream. So they, they want to they wanna learn from me, but they don't want to engage me. And I think that that kind of is, that would be my dream, right? Is that we would wake up one day and we'd be willing to have that conversation. But it's certainly a pipe dream. As the boys calls it, the psychological way to whiteness. I don't think they really want that. Do you still have a dream? Yeah. It feels like, it does not feel like the Washington Mall. It feels a lot more like the Lorraine Motel, but I, it, it might be a <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That'll get that'll get people later. Might not be the Washington Monument dream. It might. It feels a lot. It feels a lot like April Fourth, nineteen sixty-eight. You know, what it does the Washington Monument, but you know, uh, it's a dream nonetheless. Absolutely.
Do you have any questions for me regarding anything I've asked or the project or just anything <laughs> in general? This project? So, so I trust you. You're just awesome. <laughs> and uh, I have a great deal of respect for you. Always have. Uh, and so I don't really even know what this project is, but when you asked, I was like, yes, because you're Mina and you got it like that. So uh, what is this project? What am I, what am I talking to? Um, everything that I did, everything that I accomplished in debate was thanks to uh, the investment, the emotional, intellectual investment of uh, Black coaches. It gave me a backbone. It gave me a voice. Um, it gave me um, an insight into academic conversation. What, from the moment I joined debate until like now, as now a college student, um, I, was, I was functionally like raised by like Chris Randall, uh, Eli Smith, uh, Randall especially like turned me into the person I am today. And I think I owe a lot of like how I see the world, um, how I see uh, like people. Uh, it, a lot has to do with him. We um, teach at the same debate camp together. It was crazy because I would get kids coming to my office hours and be asking me questions about Eli's lecture on Afro-optimism. And I'd be like, I don't know, I can read these books. Like, I don't know why you're talking to me about this. That kind of frustration is really what motivated this, uh, this project. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there's like unconscious bias. But honestly, I think a lot of people need to like, understand the degrees of anti-blackness that exist in their life and i say degrees because i don't think anyone who is non-black is not anti-black um okay, i'm gonna get through this i'm good i'm not gonna get through this uh there's this, there's this passage in isaiah where he says uh in the year the king Isaiah died i saw also um that kind of passage, that passage of scripture means a lot to me because I guess I can draw this parallel. Um, the first year I was coaching debate was the exact same year my mother died. Okay. And the topic was public health, the United States federal government should increase its public health assistance to sub Saharan Africa. They were listening to me argue with insurance companies about dropping her from her insurance she had ovarian cancer and then one day one of the students said to me how can you and this was like a life-changing moment how can you tell us to uh, talk about the united states doing public health systems in sub saharan africa but the united states can't even help you right now how do you get us to tell you how are you going to tell us to do that And I found that to be an unethical position based on where I was and what, I, what they saw me going through. Not just what they heard, but like what they witnessed, like how, how stressful it was. And in the last years of her life, my mother was very, very vocal about, oh no, you got a responsibility to say that that ain't right. <laughs> you got a responsibility to say, you know, they had that conversation. And I think I'm just honest about it. I think other people think that that can bleed into what they teach and I, and I just don't believe them. So. I think they're just self-righteous bigots who don't admit the truth. So I, I can it's hard for me to engage with those people. I'm gonna stop the recording now, okay? Okay. Uh, so that is the end of the first half of the project. We're going to take a quick break here for five minutes or so, so that y'all can just kind of think about those 28 minutes, because there's a lot in there. And if y'all have any questions that you'd like to ask Mina, or you'd like to ask any of the uh, coaches who participate in the video who are here, I'm not sure who all is here, but I know a few of them are, uh, that would be great. Uh, if you need to take a break, stretch your legs, grab some water, whatever, before that, we'll start the second clip at 2.45 Central, so whatever time that is for y'all. What do we mean by meaningful black participation or what do we mean by making the, the activity more accessible? History kind of challenges those perspectives of, as being uh, real and relevant.
I guess like I could kind of talk about that and that just came up in the chat. I've competed on like both local and national circuits. And I guess my experience in black arguments being rejected is like people typically, the first response is if they don't understand what's called, like the arguments that we're making rather than like asking questions, trying to use it as a learning opportunity, they immediately just go to like this made up rule that they say, you're not allowed to do that NLD debate. Like that's, un or like the typical response, like um, it's unfair or just like abusive, I guess because then like you can never be fully prepared for an argument i don't know like i've been in experiences where like judges on like local tournaments would, would just tell me like they just don't think it's appropriate to bring up arguments like that because it's not like about the resolution at hand i don't know or just people just straight up just, like not willing to engage with it solely because they don't understand it The other thing, if I might add, is that there is a reticence to push certain bodies into a point of discomfort. Uh, you will see certain bodies cry. You will see them say it's unfair. You will see people say that they can't find answers to the material that you're advancing. And the reality is they're not engaging in using the right part of the library, if you will. Uh, and there's an active refusal to do that. So I do think the answer is both. Sometimes arguments get patently rejected. And uh, I also think there is implicit bias as well that exists. Uh, one of the questions I want people to consider is the idea of diversity uh, in debate versus uh, equity and inclusion in debate because I think we've done a great job, not great, we've done a really good job in increasing the number of black students, uh, brown students into debate, but that doesn't go far enough for me. The question becomes once you're in this space, how are you then treated either as a student competitor or a judge or for that matter, even a coach. And that's something as we watch the next video, we can begin to think about. Because it's one thing to say, you know, I have black students on my team, or there are now more black students participating, regardless of format. The question is then, what is their lived experience that we have to consider? But I want to keep on time, and I think it's time for Rodrigo to take over again. Uh, perfect. So, uh, will Mina. Whenever Mina finished the first project, she sent it out to everyone who was involved in the making of it uh, and everyone, obviously, who you all saw on screen. Uh, one of the pieces of feedback that she got uh, was that it felt like it wasn't done, that there was still something missing. Uh, and Eli asked her to present it uh, at Rutgers, uh, the team where he is the director of the debate uh, program, and if, asked if she could make a short addendum for that screening. And so this next clip that we're about to watch is the addendum that she made uh, when she presented it there. So let me share my screen once more. Nope, where'd it go? There it is. So here is uh, part two. to just like start the interview? Absolutely, whatever you need. So a question, so if it's the same answer, you could just say so, but why do you do debate, or why did you do debate, and why do you stay involved? Um, well, I started doing debate, like bad answer, because my brother did. Um, but I think that I kept doing debate, uh, because I think I really reveled in the sort of challenge that is involved in debate, in terms of, uh, you know, like literally being being challenged in terms of defending your positions, but also in terms of, you know, the, the hard work required to succeed. I think I really enjoyed the aspect of working to overcome direct competitors and, uh, you know, hoping to succeed to do so. I love working with young people um, to see them, uh, a term that I use is epistemologically grow, see them like come and formulate their identity, how to articulate who they are and how they see the world. And um, I also love the fact that not everybody needs to be an athlete, but 
it still has like a sense of competitiveness to them. And to me, this is the, the best intellectual activity I've seen that can allow people to compete almost at like the sports level. Well, for me, I started when I was in the Baltimore Urban Debate League. Um, I feel like that <clears throat> was an experience that was given to me that was probably once in a lifetime. Um, I was given the opportunity to go to Emory's debate camp when I was 14. And I didn't really know what debate was. I saw what it was on TV. Like, I was seeing, like, TV shows of people like, oh, I'm on a debate team, blah, blah, blah. Kind of felt like it was prophecy or something that I actually joined because there was just different signs that showed me debate. And then, like, I got offered this free trip to Atlanta or wherever Emory is um, to go. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. So I went. And then after that, I fell in love with it because I felt that it was fun. I felt that it was something that would make me smarter than my peers, faster than any other activity. And I think, like, the idea of me being in the UDL was something that influenced me to want to give back to folks and idealism right like i think that the stuff that i do matters i think that uh, it does actually change people's lives uh most debaters say that debate is the most uh, important educational activity that they've ever done and because of the foundation for others uh, i think there's an incredible power that we teach uh when we teach advocacy uh i love teaching where i teach uh i love teaching in newark i love teaching newark kids uh and i love introducing them to the uh to the skill set that they will need and that they will use for the rest of their lives. Um, for me, it, it was empowering. Someone had to listen to me, whether I looked like them or not. Um, and, you know, we went through a lot, being the only sort of like black school competing in the state of Georgia for a long stretch. But I think for me, it paved a way for me to do a lot of things in my life. And so that's why I'm still a part, you know, that's why I still coach it. I love it. Um, I love to see young people you know, whatever their argument style or whatever their goal is, I love to see that, that they are part of debate and debate helps them get to wherever they want to be. Debate for me and many others is an outlet, yes, but a way to sharpen skills. And so a lot of that sharpening of skills, you'll have to just beg the question of what skills are we sharpening? And a lot of people are like, well, debate is just arguing, so you just sharpen in that skill. And it's like, no. Uh, debate for at least my students are has afforded them an opportunity to exercise and sharpen the skill of critical thinking. I think it changed lives. Uh, it changes lives in the way of exposing people who many times do not have a voice uh, to have a voice. It is an opportunity to research both sides of uh, an important topic. Uh, it is important to be around for having students be leaders in their school, in their community, and hopefully uh, the nation uh, at some point. Uh, I feel at a time where people who are genuinely uh, intellectually curious, who are about facts, who are about advocating for themselves, their communities, and others who really don't have a voice, uh, is really important to me. So uh, I stay. And I'm also pretty good at it and I'm pretty competitive. So the competitive side of things, if I'm being, you know, keeping it 100,000, uh, uh, is also pretty important as well. It helped me be confident while I was in middle school, helped me grow when I was in high school, helped me feel like I was smart enough compared to other people when I went to college. Um, and now it makes me feel uh, confident enough to be able to pursue the things that I want to do and not really worry uh, as much about whether I fit in or whether I'm qualified because it's allowed for me to feel like I'm qualified. Other things are like super um integral to where i am in my life right now and honestly i think the best part of debate has been me working with like other people like yeah like winning things was fun and like um it definitely helped me with my confidence but uh teaching students is what made me realize that i wanted to be a teacher and i think that's mm -hmm. like kind of a pretty big deal because that's kind of determining what career path i want to go and what things actually bring me joy when i'm working um, so yeah, I'm really grateful for debate for that. Oh, the, <laughs> is this is why you do not want to show me. 
Uh, why do I do debate? I think I do debate right now because <sighs> do debate right now because it pro has provided me with the best opportunity. Uh, I think being a director of a debate program before the age of 30, uh, doing budget management, getting to mentor students, uh, getting to kind of have a say on what programming looks like on a campus. Uh, I think being able to be a part of, you know, so, like someone who gets invited to staff meetings at, you know, a school at a college campus is something I didn't think I would ever, you know, be doing. But these are all, I think, really good things that only debate would have provided me. I mean, I, I, I think that I started because I like to argue. Um, and, you know, and one of my freshman teachers said, you know, I mean, I was arguing about something and, I, and, and, and she said to me, which was a very a good thing. She said, you know, you should, you should join the debate team. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, like most kids you go, yeah, right. Join the debate team. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I went to a practice and my high school coach, uh, welcomed me in and kind of like said, you know, here's kind of what we do. And, I mean, I was apprehensive because at the time, there were few, very few African-Americans on the debate team in my high school. So I, I just didn't, I didn't, and I didn't know anybody who was black that debated. So I was like, mm, I don't know. But she welcomed me in. She, you know, she, 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 you know, told me that, you know, I could do it. I could try it. And I, and, you know, and I tried it and I was hooked. I had a few very awesome teachers very early. One was Gerald Baker, he was my ninth grade history teacher. And he was the first person really that taught me black history in a classroom kind of setting. And was also one of the debate coaches at my school. Uh, African American was one, of the, was one of the first debate coaches I ever knew. And essentially based on what I think was an adversarial relationship in the classroom, he decided that it would be best suited for me to be in debate and he's still in my life now. Um, as a result, do I feel radical? I think debate. I'll say yes or no. I think debate has kind of ruined my ability to understand what most people think of as radical. You know, some of the things that I've said, the things that I've Google searched about. You know, I can only imagine what <laughs> like an FBI file looks like because of the questions that, you know, doing research about black history and the reality of race in America leads you to, you know, to ask. I would not call myself revolutionary because I think the questions that I ask uh, and the things that I talk about are very real, very material. I think coaching students to talk about these things actively shapes the next generation of you know, debaters of Americans, uh, you know, global citizens. But I will also say yes, because when I have conversations with a lot of people outside of debate and I say, well, we said this thing or we did this thing or we read this evidence or, we, you know, found this research, people say, you know, they could never imagine doing that. You know, it's one of the reasons why when <laughs> you go on airplanes and you're going to a debate tournament, someone says, where are you all going? You know, I've stopped saying a debate tournament. I just say an academic conference. It does not feel radical to me because it seems objectively obvious. But based on people's reaction, I, was, I would assume it had to be. I, I had a white guy leave mind describe me as an acquired case. <laughs> so I, I didn't know what that meant. Um, I don't really think racial reality is the same as escargot or sushi, but I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. But James Baldwin once said that um, America, white America, is so so sleepy and so comfortable. They don't know what they believe in. It may be Coca Cola. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess if that's the measuring stick, then I would guess I probably am radical. I don't feel radical to myself, but I certainly have a radical. I have a radical impact, so I, I would have to just that way, I think. Would you say you feel radical doing what you do now or what you did? I don't. I think as a Black female, it's great to be able to coach 
um, and currently be at a predominantly white institution. And I coached, went back to my high school and coached, and then coached at a predominantly white institution in terms of high school. So for me, that's not radical, but I, you know, I relish the opportunities that I've gained and, oppor and the opportunities that I can hopefully afford to other people, especially people that look like me. Uh, but no, not, there's nothing radical about, in my opinion, what I did in terms of, you know, becoming a debate coach and stand in debate. I just think it's a great activity and, you know, I should be a part of it. So that is part two. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts you want to share, Mina, or if anyone who was involved and like spoke uh, in the documentary wants to say anything, uh, or if anyone has any questions, obviously feel free to send them in now. I'll just say something really quickly before like questions come in, which is I do think that this project is very unfinished. Um, I think that there's so much more to be uh, talked about and to be recorded and uh, there are so many more questions to be asked. Like, I think I, I have so many more questions that if I could read you all these interviews again, I could come up with a whole new set of interview questions. Um, and so there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and I think that that is like exciting. Like, I think that um, the, my hope is that like in watching these videos, it feels more like a start rather than like a, you know, these are like the first two chapters of a book rather than like the book itself is kind of like how I want people to be thinking about um, these two videos. Uh, but yeah, that was my, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I agree that like these two videos were um, just kind of the start. And honestly, I can't wait to see what the end will look like. I think that this could really go somewhere in terms of narrating a story and bringing it out and bringing to light of blackness in debate. And honestly, I think that um, if it's taken in a, in a certain way by, I don't know, quote unquote, the, like the public or whoever watches it, I think it will actually help to uh, fulfill the dreams of some of the people in, in the video. And it'll help to destigmatize de blackness in debate. So I think that this was just a really big step, really good step, a really big step towards um, some, some really good goals. It's hard to believe that nobody has questions. Uh, it can be private, it can be more public. Um, I know I have a couple for the group uh, in a bit, but um, I wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to ask Mina, who put together this project and, and or those of us who are a part of it, so you could directly ask questions. Uh, may not have the opportunity again. So this would be a good time to do that. It looks like there's a few in the chat now. Uh, it all kind of seemed to be about the same thing. So I don't, maybe not the exact same thing, but I'll read them in case anyone's not looking into the chat. You described these videos as a start slash first chapters of a book, which I definitely agree with. But what do you think are the best ways for debaters to jump off from the start slash continue the book? What can non-Black people in the debate community do to increase more Black participation? And what can we as a community do to help destigmatize Blackness in debate? Um, I'll answer the first question uh, just briefly. Uh, I think that uh, people underestimate the power of like documentation. I think a lot of the stories uh, that 
I got to hear when I was doing these interviews are things that I've like heard about um, or things that you hear about in the passing in conversation or if you're lucky enough to, uh, you know, you know, really get someone to sit down and like tell you these stories, uh, then that is kind of one way to learn about it. But I, um, I remember that the idea for this project came to me because I was taking a class about the archive and about building histories and um, obviously debate is something that I care about a lot, but I uh, was frustrated because it's hard to it's hard to feel like there are histories to be built and to be shared when uh, even like the archive itself and you know the documentation process is so fragmented. So um, I kind of think that, uh, and this was a conversation that came up when I did the screening at Rutgers, um, which is how do we encourage uh, students, recent grads, coaches, et cetera, to help participate in sort of this process of, of um, like documentation and making it so that history, uh, really important histories are like no longer elusive and they are actually concrete and they're there and undeniable. Um, I think that would kind of be my thought on that. I don't know if people who are interviewed AT or Mr. Williams, or I don't know if Randall is still on this call, but if anyone wants to speak to that. Well, it's interesting as a historian to think about debate um, that most debaters have a four year history of debate. Uh, like, however long they participate, maybe if they participate as, you know, a first year out as a judge. So basically, their entire sort of reference is four years, right? So whoever they meet in that four years um, and sort of the stories that they hear and their understanding of it is that, I think that um, for those of us who've been in the activity for a while, uh, we have a longer view. Uh, and I think that that longer view um, creates an opportunity, right? An opportunity for discussion. Um, I think a lot of the, I think a lot of times people are afraid to confront history, right? I think that when I was a kid, um, I always was one of those kids, I guess I loved history from the beginning. I was one of those kids who always sat on the porch and talked to my uncles and my grandfather and that sort of thing to understand like their stories, right? Because I knew that I was in a place because they had made sacrifices and I wanted to understand those sacrifices. I think that debate, oftentimes, the competitive uh, outpaces the, the sort of um, opportunity to just like learn, right? I mean, you wanna learn enough to do whatever it is that you wanna do, but you don't really actually wanna learn what about what it means to be black in debate, right? Um, so I think that that's one of the things I would say is that that definitely this project is an opportunity for debaters, right, for for us to just be able to think about history, right? Think about think about history. You're in an activity that has a long history, and how many people really actually know that history? I'd like to address a second question. Uh, I think it's rather important <clears throat> and is uh, <clears throat> somewhat multifaceted. How do we increase participation? Uh, I think that happens on a lot of levels. Uh, if I had to say what one of my regrets was uh, about my current school is that I haven't taught more people that look like me. And the question that becomes why if you have someone like myself or uh, Mr. Powell uh, currently works at my school. Uh, uh, Mr. Smith was there for a year. Why aren't black students then drawn to other folks that look like them? And that's something that I think we really need to figure out. Uh, part of the answer I feel is uh, there are colleagues that we all have that steer black students away from academic competitive activities. Uh, they want you to do something a little easier. Perhaps they want you to go the sports route or, you know, the entertainment route. Uh, 
Uh, at least that was my experience as a student and uh, what I see uh, currently still. So I think that as students, those are things you have to push back on. I also feel that there's an education piece that has to occur amongst communities of color about what debate is and what you're actually doing, right? Because everybody understands athletics. Uh, not everybody understands, very few people understand uh, what debate is. So there's an education piece that needs to occur even within our community. But I will go so far as to say while participation uh, is really important and we do need to increase participation, one question we need to examine quite rigorously is what active steps can we take with decision makers uh, and leaders in the activity to make the space better for you all? And that's really important to me because we could say we could have a hundred percent increase in black participation in debate but if you're truly poorly as a result of that and a year two three four years later we're talking about the stress and the emotional baggage that you then have to deal with as being part of uh, an anti-black activity we have to figure out ways to make the space uh, more inviting for people once they get here and that's a distinction i ask everyone to really engage about what it means to be diverse. And the way I define that is that's like inviting a bunch of people to a party, right? Different races, different ethnicities, different genders, things like that, right? But the question becomes, how are you equitable and inclusive once you get there? Think about it this way. If you're inviting people to a party and you have a diverse group and you have people that are coming that are vegan and you only serve barbecue, uh, that doesn't seem real inclusive. Does that make sense? That doesn't really, that doesn't really seem like you want them there. So uh, I use a barbecue reference as kind of a cultural reference on the 4th of July here, but uh, I think a lot of people will end up getting that. But I think that part's really important is what can we do to increase numbers? What can we also do to make people want to stay? and to utilize a leadership that I don't think some of you know that exists in current spaces to facilitate change. For example, the people on this screen don't mind supporting you in any way possible. Uh, Ms. Jordan, who's the director of debate at um, Georgia now, is uh, head of the National Debate Coaches Association. There are four black men on the board of the National Speech and Debate Association. And part of it is what are deliverables, what are action items that we need, that we want, that you demand to make this space uh, better for everyone. I can be a little talkative, but th those are things that I think are important. And I think agency has to be utilized uh, by all members to make it work. Um, one of the things I'll say in conclusion for me at this particular moment is, it is always interesting to me in discussions about race to see how numbers drop off in regards to uh, either people not participating initially or they end up dropping off the call if it's a Zoom thing or they don't show up the next day. And that tells me a lot uh, about their real interest in engaging uh, those things. For those people that are still here, I appreciate it. But one of the questions I ask in the chat is, if you are not Black, why is this relevant to you? And that's something I think you really need to think about, consider, etc. Um, I guess just kind of as like a, a, a a thought to that. Um, there was a question in the chat that I think is kind of relevant to that. Um, it says, was there a specific instance in which you as a non-Black debater came to the initial awakening of the suppression of Black speech and debate? And if you feel comfortable, would you be able to describe the emotional intellectual aspects of that experience and you deciding whether or not you will take action? Asking so other non-Black debaters going through the same process can relate to this. Um, so I talk about this like a little briefly in the first film, but uh, so I kind of had like a weird experience of debate. I didn't start until the summer into my junior year of high school. And my start was actually at this camp at GDS. Um, 
and uh I think it was like mm, somewhere in the first week or like beginning of the second week uh Chris Randall was asked to give um a, like a camp-wide talk about uh navigating uh like race and debate um and I don't know if this I don't I think awakening is like a a uh dangerous term because I think it implies that uh there is a a process through which like non-black persons can just like wake up and they're suddenly on the same page as everyone and now everything is like fine and we're with it and everything is just you know we're on the right path and like nothing can go wrong um and I just don't think that's right I do think it is uh like a learning process I do think part of being a non-black uh person, being a non-Black debater, being a non-Black coach, I think part of that is being willing to, to listen uh, when you are being called out for the mistakes that you make. Uh, I think Sun He said this in the, in the first film, uh, but she says that there are, are degrees to um, internalize anti-Blackness. It's not, it's not just like you are anti-Black or you're not anti-Black. She says, uh, and this is something that a lot of um, scholars also write about, but it's just that like anyone who is not Black, especially in America, but also probably the world, uh, has uh, some level of anti-Blackness internalized uh, within them. And that's why I think it was really interesting when Sunny talks about like degrees of anti-Blackness. And I think that that uh, is something that uh, words like an awakening or like a moment kind of obscure, because it wasn't just like a moment. There wasn't just one moment where I woke up and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know what that moment would even be. Um, so what I will say is, because I've also received some questions kind of privately in the chat about like, what, as an Asian American, like, what do you do about this? As an East Asian American, a light-skinned Asian American, like, what is our role in this? And this is something that came up when I presented this uh, film at Rutgers as well, uh, which is the question of what does it mean for a Korean American girl to be making a film about the history of radical Black praxis and debate? Um, I don't know if I really have a concrete answer. I don't think that there are steps. Um, I think that we have an obligation to listen to Black debaters and Black coaches when they tell us that things are going wrong and that they're not being heard. Um, I think we have a responsibility to believe them when they say that uh, the spaces are not equitable, uh, that they do not feel welcome. Uh, I never really understood the instinct when someone says, this thing has hurt me to say to them, actually, I don't believe it has hurt you. Um, you know, when people tell you that they've been hurt, usually are, your instinct should not be to say that you don't believe that. Um, so I think that's the first thing, your instinct should be to listen. Um, and then I think the second thing is there obviously is like intellectual labor that goes into that. Uh, you should uh, pay attention when your coaches are teaching you things, uh, especially coaches who have spent many, many more years than you all uh, you know, studying the stuff and reading this, reading about, uh, and also like living blackness in America. Um, and there is like work that has to be done so that you can like learn those things. But, um, to, to address the original question, there's not like an instance, there's not like a moment where it happened. Um, but I will say that the, and I, I, I will say that the closest thing that I've gotten to a moment um, is I had, when Randall was talking four or five years ago at this like navigating race and debate thing, uh, he was talking about how he uh, likes to play tennis and how, is he, I don't know if he's still on this call, but how he is bald and how he is uh, also, I don't know if some of you knew this, but Randall is very scared of raccoons. So uh, there are just like all these factors um, and he would say these things and he was telling these stories and he said, and for some reason, people are still scared of me, which is crazy to me because Randall is not just scared of raccoons, he's scared of baby raccoons. So it is wild to me that someone could be uh, so instinctively terrified of someone uh, who is scared of baby raccoons and like is probably not capable of hurting anything or anyone. Um, and that I had developed a very meaningful relationship with someone who saw potential in me and wanted to invest in me intellectually and emotionally. Um, and I realized that there are people who were never going to understand that he is uh, soft and scared of baby raccoons and all of those things because they don't see him 
like that. And I think that was, if there was a moment, there was a moment, but uh, the question is, what do you do after that moment? Um, I remember I taught at camp last summer and I gave this whole spiel about Asian Americanism and, you know, the very ingrained anti-Blackness in Asian American communities. Um, and I saw students having this moment where they were having this, like, I've called it the coming to Jesus moment where they were in tears and they were like, I cannot believe that all these things have been happening and I didn't realize it. Uh, and the question is, uh, what are you going to do after that moment? after you have the emotions and the, you realize that, you know, you have been participating in uh, systems of oppression that you benefit, that you have privilege and all of those things, and you have that breakdown, what are you gonna do <laughs> after that? Um, and I think that's what people should be focused on. Uh, and I think that's where the listening and the learning um, really comes in. But I did a lot of speaking and I have really no idea how you all are responding because all of your cameras are off, so I think I'm gonna stop speaking now. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I guess, like, if a non-Black person doesn't want to speak, I just, I guess I could just, like, give golf commentary. Um, I came in for this pretty late, actually, because it's just, like, some issues along the way. This is actually my first day, and some, that was something I did notice, too. I mean, most of the cameras were off, so I couldn't really tell, like, how many other Black participants there were, but I was just, like, the people who I was seeing, I was like, wait, whoa, like, this is a uh, lab on Afro-pessimism and Black identity-based, like, critiques, and I don't actually see, like, a lot of Black folk here, like, students-wise, and I don't know, I could be wrong, once again, like, I can't see you guys, <laughs> but um, that was just, like, something that, in my head, I thought of, and it was just kind of, like, an, an awakening moment, in a sense, I guess, because I was just, like, wait, whoa, because for me, um, in my school, like, my other, like, debate like team members like debate is a huge part of their identity and so like they have they've built a sense of community in a sense because like debate is what they do and it's something that they love so they know people from like traveling every single weekend whereas for me debate is a part of my identity but I'm also like a student athlete and a dancer and so it's just a section of who I am and so it's I haven't been really been able to build a community in a sense mainly because it's just like it's not where I am constantly and so I was kind of expecting for this experience to be something where I was like oh my god like I'm gonna meet like other people who like are interested in arguments like me I don't know maybe it's also just like the virtual setting kind of changes everything like there's kind of just a less type of connection but I just wanted to say like that was something I noticed as well and I was just like wondering and but I was really happy to see that like non-black participants like well people are interested in this it doesn't have to be necessarily like a black thing and that made me really happy I guess I don't know so yeah. So, you know, speaking as a, a non, can you guys hear me at all? Okay. So speaking as like a, a non-black mother slash coach slash educator, um, man, it, it's like, how, how does the individual interact with interrupting systemic racism? Um, it's a tough question and it's, it's hard and you know, we talk about it and we go back to it and we go back to it. And, um, you know, like our individual actions, we're trying and we try to brainstorm ways to make a, a bigger impact on like a larger community. But um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, morally, we have no choice except for to keep on trying and, um, and to stay like cognizant and aware and a part of a community that cares about trying. Um, because it, it, that's not every community out there. So, you know, I, I'm thankful for GDS and I'm, I'm thankful that I can be a part of it and that my kids can be a part of it. My family can be a part of it. And, um, and yeah, it, it's, it's hard. So yeah, I, I think brainstorming real activities that can be done on a school level, on a community level, um, you know, that would have uh, you know, I, I think for us, impacting people who are younger um, seems like a, a good way to, to intervene and, um, you know, making it open to their families um, and making it open to people in the community. Um, yeah, it, it, it's hard. So, uh, um, this is great. I'm having a great time. This is great. These are great questions. Um, I uh, am, I know that there are so many questions that there is a lot more to unpack from this. Uh, 
and there's a lot left unsaid. Um, I will be leaving my email in the chat thing. Uh, I am also, you can reach out to me on Facebook. Um, and uh, if you have something that is like urgent, <laughs> people on staff like have my number, but like either way, like I send me your email, send me your questions. If you have them for me specifically, I don't want to speak for the other panelists, this is the panel, the other people who are in the film, I don't know, um, but I'm sure that they'd be willing to chat with you as well. You have the opportunity to learn from them. Please take advantage of that. Um, but I will put my email there. I will answer all the emails. I am really would love to hear people's thoughts about what they saw. I hear people's feedback. If you just like have comments, I would love to hear that as well. Um, so I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna type that up now. But thank you all for everything. And I'm just gonna leave my email in the... I will say if folks want to stay on the call after the time is over, just to talk to any of us who were in, uh, I know I would be willing to do that. Uh, can't speak for any of the other panelists. I would be willing to bet that they would. And the point might be to ask questions that you were not comfortable in asking in a broader group with 120 people or whatever, but you may be willing to do in a smaller group. And also to come up with action items of things that you think we can do to move the conversation forward. One of my big frustration points is we have a lot of discussions about things, but then sometimes it ends there and the time is right to you know always do what is right. So we just have to figure out what some of you think that that is. I know some of us believe we have some, uh, some input in the broader national community, but a lot of that is hearing from you about action steps that are necessary. You agree with that, Mr. Williams? Mr. Randall? I do. And anybody else there? Yeah, okay. Oh, you got your not. I'm so oh. proud of you, Mina. You got your not shirt on, AT. I got my way out. Hey, I'm so proud of you, Mina. You're like, I remember when you, when I taught you at the GDS. I'm so happy. I'm very proud of you. I am an adult now. I'm just going to put that one out there. I am an adult. I am, in fact, 20 You're years old. Clearly a toddler. <laughs> and you be a toddler. And cool story, you were the one, I, I, I do, I, Mr. Williams was the first adult, like at the GDS I told about getting caught with the raccoon. And I told him that it was you who discovered me hiding in the uh, laundry room. Hiding and screaming. I, I was, I was, I took an L. There was an L hat. Yes, 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 it was, there was an L. I did not do well. Um, but yes, uh, I, I'm very excited to see your questions. I will answer all of them. I, I unfortunately do have to run, but thank you all so much, AT and Mr. Williams. Thank you guys so much for having me and for uh, believing in me enough to show my work. Thank you. Love you. Uh, love you too, Randall. And um, I'll, I, am, I am glued to this computer because I'm in quarantine and I work remotely, so I have nothing better to do. So please send me your questions so I have something interesting to talk about. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good camp. Hopefully, I'll see some yep. of you again.